in many cases, the first encounter with ideas and information that conflicts with what people know and believe, fears and antagonist re reaction. So what I try to do is, and my true success uh, stems for actually when the seeds of evidence-based knowledge um, that I, I spread blossom. So even if it takes a few months, those who were adamant about their beliefs but ended up changing some of their habits uh, were willing to learn and adapt and try to be um, to do better despite their fears. Hey everyone, welcome to another Wise and Addicts podcast episode where we explore stories of leaders and innovators in the industry. Today we are having here with us Shirley Ferber. For you that don't know, Shirley is the first equine nutritionist in Israel, in the whole country. And she's going to be sharing a little bit more about her unique experience, definitely a unique experience, and uh, more about her work with equine health, welfare, and also the work that she's doing in education. She's founder of Equita, a platform where uh, focus on educating people within the, the equine industry. And yeah, she's going to be sharing more about this with us today. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you. Hi. Good to be here. And Shirley, just before we start, you have a very unique story, right? The first equine nutritionist in, the, in Israel, in the whole country. Can you show, share us a little bit more about yourself, about your background, and also tell us how a typical day looks like in your life? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, um, hi. Uh, well, I grew up with horses and animals in general, and um, my love and inspiration started there. Um, I uh, graduated with a master's in equine science uh, from the University of Edinburgh, and I focused in my thesis on uh, nutrition management and welfare. Also um, uh, expanded on behavior as it is intrinsic and uh, they all combine together. Um, I currently live in the Lower Galilee area uh, in the northern part of Israel. And uh, I live with my beautiful mare, goofy dog and adventurous cat. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't actually have a typical day. Uh, each day varies from online consultations for horse owners um, across the country and abroad. I, uh, I do a lot of um, remote consultations and um, that could include post-surgery clinical cases in collaboration with leading events, um, as well as vi visiting stables, uh, animal shelters and feed centers or advising on feed formulations and product development. My favorite part, though, is teaching and spreading evidence-based knowledge to help as many animals as I can and the people who care for them. So that's uh, the main um, goal of Equida, my, my platform, my website. <laughs> so every day is a new day in a different day. Um, surely, so again, reinforcing that. So the first to find nutritionist in the country. What inspired you to pursue this field? And um, how has your journey been so far? I mean, when you choose such a thing where you don't have a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of uh, benchmarking or experiences in the field, in the country, you're leveraging the whole thing uh, in your area. It must be some, such a, a unique experience and very, I mean, enriching with lots of learning. Tell us a little bit more about that, about your journey. Indeed, it's very enriching and challenging as well. Um, well, I, as I said, I lived with horses my entire life, but my true inspiration blossomed um, about 15 years ago uh, with the search for the right nutritional solution for my own horse, Yuki. Um, she had intestinal issues following a bad case of streptococcus uh, equi infection, uh, known as strangles. Uh, when she was very young and local vets had minimal solutions other than trial and error. So I turned to scientific articles and consulted with specialists abroad to acquire knowledge that we didn't have here um, and tools in order to help her. I did my best and for a good long time, well, um, it worked. Um, years later though, uh, after finishing my undergraduate degree in biology, I found the Equine Science Master's program at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and uh, that enabled me to acquire more and more knowledge and experience. And uh, I realized that I found my calling as a nutritionist, uh, which is something that we desperately needed here in the country. 
Uh, unfortunately, I lost Yuki just before I graduated, but my thesis and all my work are dedicated to Yuki and honoring her memory by helping as many horses as I can. Um, it's a never ending journey. I keep learning, passing knowledge forward and finding creative solutions to support equine health and welfare. That's a, a beautiful thing, a beautiful story. And uh, it's, it's incredible to see like how the relationship between horses and men, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Like people who are like you yourself who had the opportunity to grow with your own horses, it's definitely a sentimental a uh, link that you have abound with uh, with the animal. So it's a very nice work that you're doing. Even though you lost her, you keep, as you mentioned, learning and uh, helping more animals across across uh, the country. So that's very nice. And uh, so what, what would you highlight as some of the initial and main challenges as, you know, being the first professional in your field? So first of all, I uh, started collaborating with vets and other equine professional um, colleagues, as well as collecting research data uh, from over 30 farms and 460 horses from Elat in the south and the Golan Heights in the north uh, for my thesis. And as the first nutritional study in the country, actually, um, this helped uh, identify the main issues that we needed to address, um, such as the availability and quality of different hay types, um, as well as problematic management practices due to a lack of uh, updated knowledge. So the, the first challenge was to gather more uh, information about the actual situation we have here and what we need to do in order to improve it. Okay. And you mentioned the collaboration with uh, VATS, which seems to be an important piece of your work, as you don't have a lot of other nutritionists to rely on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more how you work, how you collaborate with those veterinarians, and if you can share any interesting cases? Absolutely. So as the sole nutritionist in the country, it's hard to get uh, to everyone and every, everywhere. Um, so the, and the vets are in the field or in the hospital. So we collaborate a lot with each other. And um, I actually had uh, recently had two complex clinical cases uh, referred to me from the veterinary hospital um, uh, for unique nutritional plans to induce soft feces. Something we usually want to reduce rather than induce. Um, but uh, we succeeded in these challenging tasks uh, thanks to the close professional collaboration and highly dedicated owners. Interesting. And um... You have this collaboration with uh, veterinarians and another important aspect about your work is education, right? It's what Equida is about, uh, educating horse owners, trainers, veterinarians. Can you share a little bit more about your work uh, in education with Equida? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so I've built Equida, uh, which is the uh, combination of the word equids and the word yeda, which is in Hebrew means knowledge. So knowledge about equines and equids. Um, it's a platform that aims to make scientific research and evidence based knowledge about equine health and welfare more accessible, specifically in Hebrew. Um, and I'm also working on translating the platform to Arabic as we are a very uh, community here, um, and we try to also be a very um, uh, united community around horses. It's something that unites us, and um, yeah. So we do. So I have a lot of articles and trying to get um, scientific articles uh, simplified and um, accessible in Hebrew. And also, uh, we organize a lot of um, events and uh, lectures and courses, uh, brought some uh, interesting lectures, uh, lecturers from abroad, and try, just trying to get that knowledge out there. That seems to be a very interesting uh, platform, especially when there is a lack of knowledge, knowledge or information, uh, especially in a different language like you're doing. Um, and can you share a little bit more, I don't know, maybe some success stories about how Equida is helping uh, equine owners and other uh, people who have this relationship with equines? Yeah, so, well, I find, in general, I find that asking questions is the best way to encourage curiosity and change. 
and um, because I love teaching and I have students from very different backgrounds, cultures, beliefs, and long established traditions for feeding and managing horses um, from all the communities in Israel. Um, in many cases, the first encounter with ideas and information that conflicts with what people know and believe spears an antagonist re reaction. So what I try to do is, and my true success uh, stems for actually when the seeds of evidence-based knowledge um, that I, I spread blossom. So even if it takes a few months, those who were adamant about their beliefs but ended up changing some of their habits uh, were willing to learn and adapt and try to be um, to do better despite their fears. Uh, these are the roots that then grow and support knowledge transmission to other uh, others and help me uh, as a sole individual reach exponentially more people um, through Equida and uh, through people who are uh, exposed to it and spread more around it's uh no it's a very uh interesting thing it's what we focus as well here at wise Addicts, you know creating content that is valuable for professionals in the industry uh, making sure we are raising the bar in the industry through knowledge sharing so definitely a very important mission uh you know i don't think uh there's any doubt about the, the importance of education uh, and um although you're focused on israel you mentioned that you also do some consulting and you've done also international consulting, right, to, to other countries. What's your perception about the differences on how 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 is the equine, uh, I will call equine industry, but how, how is the equine management uh, in Israel versus how it's done in other, other, other countries? So it's not just about... Um management but also about what's available so i usually advise vets who do not have access to local nutritionists when it, it um uh um when we talk about international consultations and the first challenge is to understand what feeds and management solutions are actually available um, as well as the local equestrian culture in general and traditions so we can um, adapt accordingly so each area, even in the same country, could have completely different nutritive uh, compositions um, and, and also weather conditions. In Israel, for instance, we have the desert in the south and we have the snow in, in the north. So it, completely different conditions. Um, and uh, in uh, Colombia, for instance, there is a soil uh, calcium deficiency that affects feed sources. And uh, while in Israel, for example, there is m uh, mostly a surplus of calcium in the soil and um, the feeds. So this means that all the formulated feeds that are developed for one country, uh, continent or area are suitable uh, aren't, aren't ne um, necessarily suitable um, for or provide the same complementary complementary balance um, in another so my experience in adapting european and uh, american nutritional recommendations and products as well as um, general management solutions to the very different conditions uh, in israel uh, mostly uh, drove me to develop a framework that could support animal care professionals in adapting not only to geographical and agricultural differences, but also to local local and um, global changes, specifically, uh, for instance, the effects of climate change. That's a very interesting thing. So it's not just about uh, having the ideal nutrition plan for an animal, but actually considering their environment, where they are, the specifics about climate, uh, soil, nutritional uh, availability, and all these other aspects. Usually when people do research, uh, not it's, it's not like all the research, but uh, lots of research is done in uh, safe and secure spaces. And if we just got those, those results and we try to replicate in different places, it will probably not work as well. And then there's also availability, as you mentioned, even from uh, in terms of a supply chain, what sorts of products you can get access in uh, in specific regions, right? Uh, another point you brought about the climate and the challenges having, I don't know, snow in the north, uh, a more arid um, cl uh, climate in the south. How do you how do you work to assess those differences? How what are the strategies you would recommend to to for addressing these nutritional challenges caused by 
climate difference or climate change? Well, so, um, yeah, the diversity. That's basically what we're talking about. So diversity, like change, could be a tool. Okay, from my experience with many different cultures within Israel, as well as around the world, as I said, I've started developing a culturally adaptive animal care frame, framework, uh, which I'm lucky to present this year as a guest lecturer for the clinical animal behavior undergraduate students uh, at Hartbury University in England. And um, actually, it's just by using different biological, psychological, philosophical and zoo-anthropological models, we can address conflicts between modern evidence-based uh, recommendations and um, different cultural traditions and belief systems with respect and gradual med um, mediation focused on animal health and welfare and also consider climate change in the process. And um, yeah, so it's just combining a lot of things together in order to, to, to find the right solutions. Um, and bridge those um, differences between the communities or areas. So it's all about bridging old beliefs and tradition to new and modern uh, research and education and new information. Um, another thing that uh, you shared in our previous conversation was your plans to expand internationally, right? Uh, what excites you the most about sharing this knowledge not only with people in Israel, but expanding it to a global network? Well, I hope to further develop my framework that I mentioned for adapting and managing climate and culture change in veterinary and professional animal care practice um, in collaboration with leading researchers and professionals. So um, collaboration is key. And um, it, our shared goal is to improve animal care around the world. And I think that if we work together, we can achieve more. And what about your other goals for the coming for the coming years? What are what do you want to accomplish? So I plan to continue teaching, which is one of my favorite things, uh, and consulting. Uh, While, well, of course, I uh, plan uh, to develop further my uh, framework, as well as work on my research towards achieving my PhD. Uh, which is gonna focus on what we can learn from fecal characterization uh, on consist consistency, manipulation, and diagnostics. Um, so what we can learn from feces, actually. <laughs> um, and hopefully support the future of equine nutrition in Israel for more knowledge and more nutritionists, as well as other professionals like uh, physiotherapists and behaviorists. We have so much more to learn and do better. So just want to try and push that forward absolutely and um you have this again unique experience uh, with lots of learning being the first person in your field considering all your background and experiences what would be one piece of advice that you would give to animal care professionals i would say listen to your clients both owners and animals uh, and patience and creativity are equally important as knowledge and experience. Beautiful. Uh, so we're wrapping up here, Shirley. I want to thank you a lot for taking the time for us to have this conversation today. We are in very different time zones at this moment. You're in Israel, so I don't know how many hours difference. Um, but it's, it's incredible, right? The opportunity that we have today with all the technology to be able to uh, learn with people that are far, far from us and that's definitely a part of your your work as well so i i appreciate a lot you taking the time for for this conversation today and for our audience people that want to learn more about work that you're doing and maybe connect um yeah find opportunities for collaboration what would be the best channels for them to connect with your work with Aquita? um well you can find me on linkedin or uh, ResearcherGate and uh, Facebook, Instagram, and my Equida website, which is equida.org.il. Um, uh, and feel free to email me. I'm always happy to collaborate. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to have your name here tagged uh, some someplace probably in the title of the, the episode. For you guys that uh, access this episode through LinkedIn, there's, we're, all, we're also tagging Shirley and Equida at our uh, post. So make sure to connect to learn more and yeah, leverage this. So appreciate that. Uh, thank you all that are in our audience listening to us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I hope to see you guys all in our next episodes. 
Shirley, thank you so much. Thank you.